All right, so water towers are not a new technology. They've been around for a very long time. The whole idea is to get your water storage up off the ground a certain set distance in order to generate pressure via gravity to flow that water from your storage source out to wherever it is needed. Uh, utilities and towns, they have towers, but they're, they're vastly, they're, they're huge, and they are many hundreds of feet in the air specifically to generate the 40 to 80 PSI that is necessary to control the pressure throughout an entire small town. Um, that way you can do it without booster pumps or anything like that. Um, out here on a farm, that's not what we need. I'm just doing drip irrigation for a lot of the orchard trees, a lot of the gardens, things like that. So I don't need significantly high PSI. And so this is the design that I came up with. Um, before I built this, I did a whole lot of research. There's, there's a ton of videos out here on YouTube on people specifically building water towers. What I found is that about 95% of them are not safe. They're, they're not safely built. They are not appropriately built and they're not built to last. And, and those were my criteria that I wanted. Uh, I've got an IBC toad up there. When an IBC toad is 275 gallons, when it's completely full of water, it weighs a little over 2,000 pounds. So literally one ton worth of weight that's going to be that high off the ground. It needs to be secured on the safest possible base that you can make. So this is what I came up with. Um, I'm making this video as educational purpose because I couldn't find what I needed. Uh, I couldn't find lessons learned. I couldn't find any of that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna make my own and I'm gonna put it out there in hopes that it does help somebody else. And it hopefully gives the information necessary so that when somebody else is going to build a water tower, they do it in a very safe manner. They're not doing it in a, in a hack together manner, which is what a lot of folks have done. So I recognize most are probably not gonna build in a shelter around their tote um, or whatever tank that they're using. You have to somehow keep the sunlight off of your tank, whether you paint the tank, whether you cover the tank in a tarp, or in my case, you build a building. Out here on the farm, I didn't want just a tank on top of a tower. It would, it would look weird and out of place. And so my process to ensure that everything matched out here was to build a building around the tank itself. And the building is what keeps the sunlight off the tank to keep the algae growth from occurring, keep any of the water from getting scummy up in there as it, as it sits up there for weeks at a time, as well as it protects the tote. You know, plastic does degrade with UV exposure, things like that. And I don't have to worry about painting. Uh, you can't just paint an IBC tote. Um, there's tons of people out there. You're gonna see videos of people doing that. Uh, sure, you can go out and you can get a bottle of Krylon and you can, you can just paint it yourself. Uh, it's not going to last. You, you're going to be lucky to get maybe a season or two out of it. Uh, you know, polyethylene and polypropylene, which is the plastic that these tanks are made out of, does not, you know, paint does not bond to that. You have to do something to actually get the paint to bond. So you've got to use either a bonding agent, some form of pretty nasty chemical to get a, a proper bond, or you have to cover it with a tarp or something like that. You can paint it, but it's going to scratch. It's going to flake off with the expansion and contraction of the tank. So I didn't want to do that. So my solution here is to just build a box around the tank itself and that's what controls the sunlight getting to the tank. So the first thing I want to talk about is the base and it's a very simple design here. You've got four posts on each corner. Now these are 10 foot posts and they are not cut down whatsoever. So they are roughly five and a half feet out of the ground which means they are four and a half feet into the ground and that is critical. Here I'll try and get you out of the sunlight. That's critical here because if you're gonna have this amount of weight up high, that's fine. You need to ensure your side to side motion is constrained as best as humanly possible. And so if you've got half of your corner posts buried, that automatically helps prevent any kind of side to side movement. Then on top of that, I've got all of our cross bracing and it's doubled up per side. So every single side is tethered from corner to corner and none of this is held together with screws everything is lag bolted and that's the other thing that I see a lot of people not doing most people are just gonna screw this stuff together and hope that the screws hold and that's really not it when you have any kind of wind load which for us out here we're kind of on the plains area so we do get a lot of straight line winds and sometimes in excess of 60 70 mile an hour right so if you have screws right here and you have that kind of wind load happening, well, that screw has a cross-sectional area of less than a quarter of an inch. I mean, absolute minuscule. You're talking, you know, a couple sixteenths of an inch at best. And you're asking that to hold against 
this massive pressure that's being ex exerted onto the side of this building. And that, that's not, that your screws are going to shear off. So what you want to do is you want to use hardware. So this is grade eight, and you really don't even truly need grade eight, but the point is half inch bolts. And each and every single one of these cross braces is held in with a half inch bolt. So that's, that's the first part here. Now the other thing, and I gotta get underneath here. So the design that I did is all compression loading. So you've got your, your corner posts, but then across the top, you've got this spanner beam, and it's the exact same as another four by four. And all it does is span, it sits on top of these posts all the way down. We got one over here and we got one over there. And these are actually lag bolted in. So there is a half inch lag bolt that is seven inches long and recessed into the top of this beam about an inch that holds this beam to the uprights. Then I use additional four by fours. And again, these are just reclaimed at this point in time. Nothing, nothing fancy, nothing special. And we've got one, two, three. And the way that these are set is that where the tank sits, and you'll notice that this is offset inward. So where the, where the tank sits in this tower, the very back of the tank sits directly on top of this four by four. And the middle of the tank sits directly on this one. And the front of the tank sits directly on this beam. And so what that means is that all of the weight of that tote, of that water inside that tote, is being exerted directly onto these three beams, which is then being transferred directly to this cross beam, which is then being transferred directly to the posts. And that is all compression load. There is not one bit of shear. And, and the major problem that I see with a lot of people building these towers is that they'll get their posts in the ground, they'll get some cross bracing on, but then they'll run the equivalent of a two by eight right across these posts and they'll nail it in, whether it's nails or screws, and they'll have two or three, you know, however many it may be. But then all of their joists that run across are either held in place with a U-bracket to that particular two by eight, or it's just resting on top of that two by eight. And what that effectively does is that all of the weight of what you put in here, all of that water, is gonna be transposed down onto that two by eight, but then that two by eight is only held into its corner posts with a handful of nails or screws that again are very, very thin and it's all in shear. And so what it means is that as your bolt is sticking out like this, or sorry, not bolt, but your screw is sticking out like this, the force is pushing down on it like this. And screws and nails are not very strong in shear, not nearly as strong in shear as they are in compression load. So the design that I have completely eliminates shear loading altogether, it's all compression loading. And so at this point, the only thing this tower needs to worry about is wind load, side to side movement from the wind and things of that nature. Now, the top is all just held together with screws. It's very simple. It's just a two by four frame with two by four uh, rafters and then some purlings across the top and then it's all just clad in old reclaimed barn siding. It's nothing special, it's nothing fancy and it doesn't really need to be in the same way that when you build your house, your house is built the exact same way. It's the foundation of the house that matters the most. And it's the same, uh, same principle here. It's the foundation, it's the base of this that matters the most. What's on top, not a big deal, it, as long as it gets the job done. So I'm on top right now, and this is just the deck that stands across the front so that you have access to get up in here. And all this is, is deck boards that have plenty of room to reach your hands through and grab when you're climbing up the ladder, as well as pr plenty of room to, to shed rainwater and stuff like that. And we just have a simple latch. Now the doors need readjusted. They've settled just a bit, which is to be expected. So they're a little tight. But this is the inside of the tower. And you'll notice it's all just two by four framed and then just two by four rafters, old reclaimed barn tent on the top. And then it's all clad in tar paper in order to keep and seal out any amount of potential light. 
Now the tank is here, and this is where things got a little bit interesting. Um, you know, they're just plumbed straight through the floor, and I gotta I gotta seal up around that one a little bit. Uh, this is our filled hose that goes to the top, and this tank was already threaded with a two-inch fitting right here, and so this was you know piece of cake. Uh, one of the other tanks was not, and so I had to drill a hole and install a bulkhead fitting. It's it's not hard, and bulkhead fittings are like three dollars from the hardware store. Uh, this doesn't really truly need to be watertight because if you're ever leaking out of this, it means you're overfilling the tank to begin with. So this is just kind of whatever. Um, the, the one lesson learned here is that you need to drill vent holes. And I had had one single vent hole here and it wasn't enough and the tank actually started to balloon out when I was filling. So then I went through and I added more vent holes and they still weren't enough so I had to come in and add one massive vent hole. So you need to have <coughs> a rather large vent system to this tank. Now, uh, I'm looking at doing a, a filter system to go over this just to keep anything from getting in. Um, that said, the way that I have this building sealed, it's not all that necessary uh, to have a, a filter here because there's, there's not even a way really truly for bugs to get in here because I've got it buttoned up so tight in here. Um, however, it is something that I would like to do. Um, basically, just a breather cap is all I want. So another thing that I want to quickly make note of, you'll notice that the tank is down here, but the roof line is clear up here. It's by design. So this tower is designed such that I can throw gutters on each side, have them plumb together on the back side, and then have a, uh, a pipe come in and dive right through into the top of the tank here so we can capture rainwater. Now, I don't have that set up yet. The reality is the square footage of what this roof is is not going to net much to anything at all unless we have an absolute insane flat out downpour, right? It's the only way we're going to actually capture any measurable amount of rain to backfill into this tank. That said, any amount of water is a good amount of water, specifically if you do not have a water truck that can very easily fill these things. So keep that in mind. If you're going to build a water tower, even if you're not going to necessarily set one up right away, it is worthwhile to ensure that your sidewalls are high enough so that the bottom of your roof line, which is right about in this area right here, can then accept a gutter and you can pipe those back and into the tank. I use PVC for all of our, our wobblers, all of our sprinkler wobblers uh, throughout the gardens and those are all operating at, at 15 PSI and they all run PVC slip joints. So on that logic, this is just a slip joint that's a, a glued fitting. It's not a big deal. We're seeing not even not even two PSI at the bottom of this tank if it's a full tank. Um, you know, further down the line, you, you'll see uh, right around five PSI at, at the bottom where the, the manifold is. Uh, but even then, that's not really enough uh, to, to blow apart a, a glued slip joint. So. You really shouldn't have to worry on on ensuring that it's all completely threaded all the way down. Um, I looked into doing that and that was going to be rather expensive. Vice slip joints were super cheap and super easy and you can find those kind of fittings anywhere. So that's the other lesson learned. You, you shouldn't have to worry. Uh, this is proof. I've got this thing completely full and none of these, and I've had it this way for a long time. We've, we've been using these all summer now at this point. Um, and we haven't had any issues with uh, just glued together slip joints. Just ensure that you've got the nice thick slip joints. You, you don't want a shoulder that's only three quarters of an inch to an inch. You want the nice big two inch shoulder so you get plenty of contact area there and plenty of glue to hold it together. So that's my other piece of advice for you. All right, so the logistics of filling these towers. Um, I tried to do this as simply as I could. I've actually got a water truck that I built specifically for this, but it's all via this valve system right here, which is that same yellow line that you saw going all the way up to the top of the tote. And all it is is just, you've got a gator lock fitting here, you've got a ball valve that turns it on and off, and then you've got just line. And all I do is I've got a big hose right here um, that comes off the truck between the water pump and, and this, and you just hook it together, throw your valve on, and you start pumping in. Um, as far as plumbing that comes out, it comes down from the top into, we've, we've got a post filter. Everything that goes into this tower is already pre-filtered water, uh, but we've still got a post filter just to ensure that there's absolutely no junk that gets into our drip lines down here. Um, and then that obviously feeds into 
a, uh, a water manifold here. And then this breaks into our individual drip lines that go out to the fruit trees and, and everywhere else. So for filling the water towers and maintaining the water towers, this is the rig. And what it is, is an old Ford pickup. It's a F350 frame. It's a 77 frame with a 78 F250 body on it. Picked it up without a title, got it dirt cheap. Um, it's a runner, uh, just a simple, you know, 351 modified 400 with a C6 behind it. Everything works great. But the beauty is what lies from the back of the cab and beyond. And so what I did was I found an old, and we'll go to this side so you can see it better. I found an old saddle tank up the road, uh, picked it up for basically next to nothing. And the problem with it, again, is just like the totes themselves, uh, it, it doesn't lock out sunlight. And so if you wanna keep any kind of algae growth, things like that down, you have to paint it. And so the, the proper appropriate way to paint this, um, I went ahead and, and hit it with the pressure washer, got all the scum, got all the gunk off the exterior. Once that was done, then I wet sanded everything. After we were done wet sanding, then I did a complete degreaser cleaning of the entirety of the tank. Once all of that was done, and, and that process took two or three days right there. Once that was done, then I had to go out and I had a particular bonding agent. Um, it, it's a really nasty chemical. I'll get a photo of it linked for you. But we were able to coat the tank completely with that. And it, it's an adhesion promoter effectively, specifically for polypropylene, because this is a polypropylene tank. Once we did that, within 30 minutes, you gotta have your first coat on. And so we painted the whole thing black and a grand total of, I believe, four coats of black paint on this tank. And that completely seals out all the sunlight. So the problem with leaving the tank painted black is that, you know, ultimately, if you need to have cool water, then that's gonna be your problem. For me, it didn't really matter. Um, what did matter is that with it left black and it retaining heat, it's gonna cause the tank to expand and contract at a higher magnitude as well as more often. And that has the potential to degrade the paint and degrade the tank at a much more rapid pace than if we were to actually paint the tank white and to try to reflect as much of that thermal energy as we can in order to keep the tank and its contents a little bit cooler. So that was my approach. Plus, it just it looks better with a white truck and a white tank, right? Uh, that wasn't the real rationale, but you know, byproduct of it all. Had to re-weld a little bit on the actual saddle itself. Got all of it directly attached to the frame. Once that was attached to the frame, then again, just used a bunch of reclaimed boards and reclaimed lumber and beams and built the entire bed around the tank itself. Uh, found a water pump, dirt cheap used. Got it, got it set down nice and low so it's roughly at the same output. And then the way that this is designed. So the output is up there at the bottom of the tank and then it flows down into this T. And from the T, it flows up, and it's gonna to go to the water pump, and then it also continues to flow this way, and it flows into this valve. And this valve, this valve is specifically for emptying the tank, whether you have a pool, you know, we got the pool out back, the stock tank pool, so we're able to fill the pool right off of this truck, or in the fall, you don't wanna, when you're putting everything away for storage for the winter months, where it gets cold, you don't wanna have any water left in this system because it'll freeze, it'll cause all kinds of problems. So that's our main drain. And that is the absolute low point of the system. So that other line that comes up, comes into a valve and then goes into the water pump. And we have a valve here so that we can shut off the pressure going into the pump because you never wanna store the pump with pressure constantly on it. It's, it's just not good for the lifetime of a pump. So we've got a simple valve here. And when we're ready to pump, obviously we hook up the hose and then we turn the valve on let this prime itself fire it up and we're good to go. Um, the last part is that we have this output right here, which is a one inch threaded fitting into a three quarter inch line. And it goes through the frame, comes along to this, which is just the simple ball valve that goes into this manifold that then has all the quick connects for hoses. And so the intention here is that not only can I fill the water towers with this truck, but I can also drop this truck off anywhere on the property where we need something watered and tie into this. And then we can water you know, four trees simultaneously or we can uh, feed water to whatever kind of watering system that we need at any given place where we don't currently have a water tower stationed or access to any kind of running water. And so that, that has been critical in this design as well of the truck. Um, 
you know this is just a spray tank system I'm not going to really cover that in depth it's just for spraying of the fruit trees and then we just have a rack that we slap together with some spare sheet metal laying around and that's what holds all the hoses and such this is our main fill line and it loops all the way around the back of the truck and then we've got a, a simple four foot extension there for when we need it um, and all it does is it hooks from the tank here into the water tower itself so there's a lot of different adhesion promoters that you can use. I did a whole lot of research on trying to figure out the best one for the job. And I had landed on a project or a product from 3M. And that's what I was hunting down trying to find. But I went ahead and there's an auto body specialist up the road, not far from us. And I gave them a call and I was explaining what I needed to do. And so rather than going with that product from 3M, they gave me this, which is Transstar 1021 Plasto Mend, and it's it's specifically built for patching plastic, not so much for painting. But this is the stuff that the pros use specifically when it comes to polypropylene. And I got a hold of the MSDS for this, and it's some nasty stuff, so you don't want to breathe it or anything like that when you're applying it. But I will say. Uh, it sprays very easy with just your typical spray gun, nothing fancy. You can do it with a HVLP or anything like that. Um, I just did it from that old siphon feed. But that's been my luck so far for painting polypropylene. Uh, um, the same exact chemical should be able to be utilized with polyethylene um, so that if you are going to not build a structure around an IBC tote, you're just going to leave an IBC tote on tower, that's fine. Um, don't try to paint that tote with anything. So you coat it with something like that. Despite what other people are gonna tell you, don't go out and buy Krylon, buy something like that, apply it, and then apply your paint on top of that and use an acrylic um, latex paint. Because they stay, and I don't, I don't see if, oh, here it is. I just used a Pittsburgh. Just an acrylic latex, 100% acrylic latex. Um, because it never fully hardens, it stays pliable so that it can allow the tank to expand and contract and not chip or wear off the paint. So that's my my spiel for getting any kind of plastic tank painted. All right, so filling the tank, it's nothing special. Ah, just garden hose off the house well. You know, eventually the plan is to get a, uh, a wind-driven windmill out here and have that pump into a cistern like a 5,000 gallon cistern or something like that. And then from the cistern, we can empty into the animal barns for water and the water troughs. We can fill this truck. Here, I'm just gonna set you. And so eventually we'll have a cistern with a windmill to fill it up. And then to fill up the truck, we'll just go over to the cistern, fire up the water pump on the cistern, and we can fill that 500 gallons in pretty well no time. But for now, it's just the old school way of three quarter inch garden hose, because that's what we have, and farming is all about making do with what you have. So here we are. So I recognize that I'm in a unique situation here. You know, a lot of folks 
aren't necessarily going to build something like this to this degree. Um, and that's fine. You know, I've, I've got tons of, of spare lumber laying around it. I, I have the ability to do these kind of things. With material prices right now, if you wanted to do this and you had to go out and buy all of this lumber, it wouldn't exactly be a, a very inexpensive venture. And so I recognize that I'm, I'm unique in this. However, what I, what I want to ensure that I'm covering is the absolute necessity for building the base as strong as you possibly can. You know, not a lot of folks are doing that, and it's a recipe for disaster. I'm not saying that the disaster is necessarily going to strike you if you don't do it this way, but if you've got small kids running around like I do, um, or you've got animals, or you're right next to buildings like this, you don't want this collapsing in on anything. And again, you know, this is designed to last the next 10 plus years. If you just need something temporary, slap something up, call it a day. But if you're wanting something a little bit more long term, at least take the time to put together the base as appropriately as you can to be as strong as you possibly can. And this is coming from an engineer. You need to do at least that. That's where you need to put your due diligence. Anything you do from the base up, that's entirely your own prerogative. You know, if you, if you like this style, feel free to copy me. I don't, I don't, I don't want anything out of it. I'm, I'm doing this for educational purposes. Um, but it's up to you. As long as you make the base as strong as you possibly can, that's what matters at the end. And that is the sole reason I wanted to do this video so that people understand that. So hopefully that helps some folks. I've got some lessons learned that I went over and some other things. I, I hope that helps you as, as you're working on your own process of doing one of these. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. I'm pretty much an open book. I got, I'll answer anything, any questions that anybody ever has. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not secretive about anything I do. So hope it helps. Best of luck to you.